Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Greg Wilpert coming to you from Quito, Ecuador. Thursday, June 23rd, the citizens of Britain will hold a historic referendum on whether or not Britain should remain or leave the European Union. Arguments for Britain to remain or leave the EU have not divided up nicely along ideological lines. But as both the left and the right in Britain are each divided on the issue. The right's arguments, though, which have centered on the referendum's outcome for immigration and the economy, have tended to prevail in the mass media in Britain. So with us to present the left's arguments for leaving the EU is Neil Davidson. He is a professor of sociology at the University of Glasgow and is author of Nation States, Consciousness and Competition. He joins us from a town near Edinburgh. Thanks, Neil, for being on the program. Hi, glad to be here, Greg. So let's begin with your arguments on why Britain ought to leave the EU. And then we'll talk about your response to some of the arguments on the left for remaining. So first, why do you think Britain should leave? It's to do with the kind of organization that the EU is, which I think has tended to get a bit lost in some of this discussion. It's obviously always been an institution for linking up capitalist economies. Um, but over the last, say, 25 years, since the 1980s, it's turned decisively towards neoliberalism. Uh, it's also an institution which is extraordinarily difficult to actually reform or change in any serious way. Although there is a parliament, it has very little power. And most of the institutional power lies with the commission, which is unelected bureaucrats, or with the council, which does consist of elected leaders of states, but these people were elected by their own countries, not by the European population as a whole. So there's very little democratic control. And what's more serious, I think, about it is that it contains sets of rules which are binding on all participants in the union, which are intended to prevent governments doing certain things which are against the interests of the neoliberal order. So you've got unelected bureaucrats on the one hand and a set of unbreakable rules on the other or at least rules which can only be broken by the most powerful states, like Germany and France, which are designed to box in certain things, privatization, the amount you can spend in the public sector compared to debt, and so on. All of that is a way of reinforcing neoliberalism. Now, of course, uh, we've seen recently in Greece uh, what that can lead to in terms of the weaker states within the Eurozone in particular. Uh, and the Greeks will be coming back, of course, for a further loan in a couple of months' time, and we can expect further brutality from the Commission towards them and the Central European Bank uh, in terms of demands for more privatization, more cuts and so on. Britain to a certain extent is outside that because it isn't in the Eurozone, but it is still subject to some of the rules that the EU has. And I think that we have to look beyond however simply how this affects Britain and think about the other countries involved here and what we think about the EU as a whole. So my, my, my real argument is that it's, it's, it's not a friend to the workers or to uh, anything that people on the left would normally look to. and. Um, I think that the main reason why people, as we'll probably come on to, the main reason why people want to stay in is actually because they see it as a lesser of two evils rather than because they positively endorse the EU itself. Well, that's certainly, I think that's uh, exactly one of the arguments. I mean, when, I, when you hear some of the arguments coming from uh, Labour Party leader Jeremy Corbyn, uh, they focused on the social benefits uh, that the EU helps a guarantee in the face of um, a Tory government, perhaps, such as equality for women or uh, uh, in a, uh, guaranteeing the right to strike. Um, and so also the unions seem to have supported, uh, to a large extent, the um, remaining in, in the EU. Um, mm -hmm. And then some also have argued uh, for remaining in terms of the argument about um, that it would uh, prevent a rightward drift of the EU or even the dissolution of the EU. So let's, let's look at each one of these arguments uh, one at a time. I mean, you seem very skeptical about the argument that there's any kind of social benefits, that there's some kind of protection for workers that the EU provides. What's your response exactly? I mean, is there really no protection or is it just not worth it? Well, there are some, but I mean, you've got to look at how the, the different aspects which do relate to workers' rights came into being. Um, like everywhere in the capitalist world after World War II, the, the overall tendency of the, the predecessors of the EU now was broadly social democratic, Keynesian, uh, state interventionist and so on. But as the world economy has shifted towards neoliberalism, it's shifted with it. So you've got historic rights that are built in that were really established very early on in the 60s and very early 70s. You've some rights which were used to kind of lure in the labor movements in the socialist parties in the 1980s, particularly under the period of Jacques Delors. And then you've some which were established by Germany um, in the early, at the behest of the Germans particularly, in the early part of the 21st century to establish a so-called level playing field, although that's obviously meant worse conditions for some of the weaker states. But these, this is over. I mean, there's no more rights coming down the pipeline. 
And many of the legal decisions of the European court, the, the so-called Viking and Laval decisions, have prioritized the movement of capital and the movement of services across state borders to those of the workers' rights to collectively organize. So uh, what you get now is a sense of a, a, a very basic level of, of, of rights, which in many cases, including Britain, actually, the, the individual nations have superior rights to the ones offered by the EU, including things like holiday pay in, in Britain, for example. Uh, it's also true that in many cases these rights were established by struggles of workers well before the EU picked them up. I mean, equal pay for women in Britain was established by striking women at the Dagenham Ford plant in 1968. It wasn't established by the EU. So a lot of things tend to get credited to the EU that actually were achieved by individual nation states and their labour movements, in which the EU sometimes picked up, sometimes didn't. So I think you, th there's an awful lot of exaggeration about this. But even the rights that do exist, these are not what the EU exists to do. I mean, these are in some ways peripheral rights or, or things that, well, any state has, it gives some concessions to workers at some point. That doesn't put the central core of what the EU is about is. And as we see the, the, the greater depth of neoliberalism take hold, then I think these rights are under a lot of attack from within the EU itself. You also have to remember that, that, that in many ways the EU acts as an excuse for uh, individual nation state governments to do what they would want to do anyway in terms of attacking workers. And they simply say, we've got to do it because the EU tells us to. It isn't obvious to me how the EU is protecting workers in France, for example, at the moment, who are being attacked by police building truncheons and, and, and so on, or how their rights are being defended in any serious way by that. So I think there's just a lot of exaggeration to do with the question of workers' rights. Yeah. What, what, what about then the argument, uh, and this has been more presented on the right for uh, remaining, but I've, I've seen some people on the left also making this argument that um, uh, Britain also Joined, uh, enjoys economic benefits from being from its membership in the EU, particularly the trade and the jobs that are created by the trade, and that it would lose those um, those jobs uh, because of the lack or the reduction in trade that would happen if the if Britain leaves the EU. Is that at all an argument that you would, uh, or how would you respond to that argument? Well, I certainly think that the majority of British capitalists want to stay in the EU which would make you wonder why socialists would want to defend that. I mean, they, they see it as in their interest to be in the EU, um, uh, partly for ease of access to markets, partly because the city of London uh, is used as a kind of off offshore boarding point for many capitalists to, to, to invest in, in the European Union from London. Um, so there's a, there are interests here, but I don't think it's the interest of socialists to say, well, this is good for capital. You know, I mean, the, the problem with the British economy is that it's weighted so far towards the financial sector uh, and towards services, uh, which are real problems because you can't export services in the same way you can um, cars or, or refrigerators or whatever. So there's a problem with the British economy, but it's not particularly with the EU. It's about the way in which it's now dominated by the city of London uh, and by finance, the financial sector more generally, and why there hasn't been a turn towards manufacturing or any kind of economy that would be able to sell uh, in, in the broader world. But coming out of the EU isn't going to automatically resolve any of that. I think some of the, the arguments both for and against this are massively exaggerated, by the way. I mean, there isn't going to be an apocalypse, you know, just because economically, because Britain comes out of the EU. Um, but I think that that's not a question that I think we should get sucked into arguing for. I mean, lining up with one gang of capitalists as opposed to another, um, in this sense. And clearly the majority uh, see their interests as being in the EU. Um, no, I, I assume they know what they're doing, <laughs> and they're, they're accurate reflecting their own interests here. Um, so that's another reason, I think, for points towards out rather than towards staying in. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, the kind of the third argument that uh, has been presented a lot often from also from the left is that um, the uh, having the uh, Britain leave would mean uh, would contribute towards a rightward drift of uh, Europe as a whole, would basically strengthen the right both in Britain, but also in Europe and contribute towards the dis complete dissolution of the European Union and thereby potentially undermining one of its reasons for being. I mean, one of its main reasons, of course, was uh, the whole trade issue, but the other reason being uh, to uh, uh, reduce the possibility of inter-European conflict. So, uh, and if there's a rightward drift, that might potentially increase that kind of conflict. So what's, uh, what's your view on that? Is there well, any uh, validity to that argument? I, I think, again, the argument about the, the EU being the reason why there's not been war between the major European states is, is, again, massively exaggerated. The reason why there hasn't been war is because most of the, the Western European states were lined up with America in the Cold War, and their, their kind of war tensions were directed outwards at the Eastern Bloc rather than internally. Clearly, the, the French-German rivalry has, has been a, a huge problem in Europe for the previous 
hundred years or more. But that, the, the reason there has been war isn't because of the, the EU. It, it's, it's been because the, the rivalry took across, took across two social blocks rather than within the nation states themselves. Since the, the, the Stalinist bloc collapsed in 1989-91, what you have seen uh, is, is a war returning to Europe in which the individual nations of the EU have backed different states almost by proxy. That happened in Yugoslavia during this disintegration. It's happening in Africa now, particularly with French interventions in Central Africa. Uh, and relation uh, in the Middle East. So the, the war has been externalised, if you like, rather than internalised. But in the same way, it hasn't done away with um, power power relations within the EU itself. Clearly, the, the German-French bloc, which used to include Italy as well to some extent, dominated the EU. And now it's essentially Germany that dominates it alone. And that means there's a structure of unevenness and power within the EU from the top down in which the weakest states, like Greece most obviously, but also Iceland, Ireland, um, Iceland, Spain, Portugal, uh, are essentially hammered by, by the European Union's bureaucracy and by its German leadership in order to put them into line, which is to put them into neoliberal um, structures and, 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 and so on. So that, I mean, okay, that's not war, but it, it's economic power exercised by the stronger states against the weaker ones. So I think there's a, a very strong argument for saying that the EU has to be broken up and that any serious uh, coming together of, of peoples or states to form a progressive, let alone socialist union, has to be a, a different project altogether. It can't happen by, by using the existing relationship of states that exist in the EU just now. Um, I, I think on the, a lot of um, countries who were either ruled by fascists, uh, Spain, Portugal, Greece to a certain extent, or were on the Eastern Bloc, look towards the EU as a kind of civilizing influence. And coming from where they come from, that's understandable. But nevertheless, they're now experiencing, and again, the, Greece, the Greek experience is the most stark example of this, what, what it means to be subjected to the power of, a, of an accountable bureaucracy and of the stronger nations that want to impose its rule. So I, I, I don't buy this. It's true there hasn't been, hasn't been war, and I don't expect France and Germany to go to war you know, in the near future, but that doesn't mean there isn't, there isn't relations of power within it and, and the stronger power exercising that over the weaker ones. Just to summarize briefly the argument on the left and on the right, uh, I mean, particularly on the left, seems to be to a large extent about whether or not it's possible to reform, either reform the UN, uh, EU from within or to uh, completely let it dissolve and start something new, which is what seems like, uh, which is basically what you're arguing for, right? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thanks argument. again, Neil, for joining us. Um, it's a really interesting conversation. We'll see what happens tomorrow in the vote. And uh, we'll probably come back for further analysis. Thanks so much again for joining us. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. And thank you for watching The Real News Network.